Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you, albeit virtually. And I wish we weren't living in a world where virtual talk were, the, unfortunately, the only option. Today, I'm going to tell you about work that we're doing that brings together um, three threads that have been with me throughout most of my career, machine learning, computer vision, and human biology. And we're bringing them together in the service of what I don't think I need to convince you is a truly important societal problem, which is that of discovering new drugs and um, doing so faster and more cost effectively. So the, theory, the story of drug discovery is one of a glass half full and a glass half empty. The glass half full part is that in the last 50 years, the field has made tremendous progress in taking diseases that were once a death sentence or a sentence to a life of pain, um, something that is a, a manageable uh, condition or sometimes even a cure. Vaccines are a wonderful example that have transformed many infectious diseases to something that um, is um, largely not um, a problem in many cases. Um, biologics that have helped with cancer and with immunotherapy, uh, providing a cure for certain kinds of cancer, even in the context of metastatic disease. And genetically targeted therapies that by using our understanding of the human genome have identified specific drugs for specific variations that have taken diseases such as cystic fibrosis that used to be a death sentence at the age of 20 into something that people can now live a long and healthy life with. So in that respect, the field has made a tremendous amount of progress. The glass half empty side is what's come to be called as Irum's law. Here what we'll notice is the inverse of the familiar Moore's law, which corresponds to an exponential increase in productivity of the tech side. Uh, unfortunately, Irum's law, the inverse, is an exponential decrease in R&D productivity, measured, for example, by the number of drugs approved per billion US dollars in R&D spend. This uh, number has been decreasing exponentially year on year for about 70 years now. Now, there's many reasons that drive this phenomenon, but one of them is uh, simply a failure to predict when we make critical decisions along the path, uh, which of the paths is likely to be successful and which one is not. And many paths in this area are failures because biology is really complicated. So picking which is the right one is truly important for uh, productivity because often it takes several years and tens of millions of dollars before we find that we took the wrong direction. So our goal in uh, what we're doing is to look for these pivotal forks in the road where the decisions are currently made by historical heuristics or rules of thumb and rather use machine learning to explicitly train models to make these decisions more accurately. So in order to do that, we're looking for places where if we did that, that would actually be transformative to the R&D process, where machine learning is the right tool for the job, and very importantly, where we can produce the right data at high quality and at the right scale. Because the data that you get by simply amalgamating uh, pieces of dribs and drabs of data from here and there are rarely enough for driving really high quality decisions in high stakes decisions such as this. So to illustrate the fact that data quality is important, I'm going to use an example from Badgley et al. that was published a couple years ago, um, where they really made this point in a beautiful way. They showed um, the application of a deep neural network to the problem of analyzing uh, radi radiographic images, x-ray images, in order to be able to predict fracture versus non-fracture. And they applied the usual bag of tricks, and they came up with what seemed like a pretty good ROC curve, as you can see see here on the right. Um, but then they started to visualize the um, underlying predictive model and they saw that uh, in the clusters of the um, penultimate layer in the neural network here, uh, we don't see a nice clean separation between fracture and non-fracture. What we do see, in fact, is a beautiful separation, however, um, between the different uh, scanners that took the scan. And so what really seems to be happening here is that the machine learning model is picking up on which is the scanner that actually did the scan. So it turns out that when you then uh, correct for that, um, you find that the performance of the machine learning model effectively gets closed 
uh, to random. That is, when you correct for which um, hospital and which scanner, it's like the scan, you get random performance, which basically suggests that what was happening is that the machine learning model was using artifacts from the scanner to identify which hospital took the scan, and there is simply a different uh, population in these hospitals um, giving rise to a different prevalence of fracture versus non-fracture. So data quality really matters. And that, in fact, is what drove um, our um, move, our, our, our thinking that this is now the right time to go into this space. Because when I started working in biology about 20 years ago, big data in biology were data sets of a couple dozen samples. 200 was considered really large. We're now in a world where that has changed because there is now technologies that have um, been developed by really amazing people in cell biology um, and in bioengineering that enable us to create massive amount of disease relevant data. Some of those tools include what are known as iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that are derived by taking just skin cells from any one of us, uh, reverting them back to stem cell status, which means that they could then be, um, they, are, uh, they could then move into any cell lineage, and then differentiating them into neurons or hepatocytes, liver cells, or cardiomyocytes, heart cells. And then those are now cells that are healthy human cells, but with the genetics, the disease burden, the genetic disease burden of the patient um, from where they came, from whence they came. That allows us to create models of disease that are genetically driven and yet, um, and, and court, but are in the right disease relevant cell type. We also have the ability to perturb those cells using technologies like genome editing, using CRISPR, to further uh, understand what the effect that we see of a particular genetic intervention is on, what, uh, on the state of the cell. We can measure the state of the cell using a variety of phenotyping techniques, of which microscopy is one very important one, but there's also, for instance, single cell RNA sequencing and others. And we can do this all at scale using automation and microfluidics. You put all of these together, what we end up with is a perfect storm of data production, uh, which allows us to create massive disease-relevant data sets uh, with enormous amounts of data. Right now, people are incapable of looking at these data and really extracting substantial insights from them. You can look at the surface layer, and often there's insights there, but if you really want to make the most value of these data sets, one really needs the kind of technologies that on the machine learning side have been developed also in the last eight to 10 years. So you can now put these two revolutions together and both create massive amounts of data as well as interpret it. So I'm going to show you two vignettes of the work that we've been doing in order to um, exploit large amounts of data in biology using machine learning. Um, the first of those is on the analysis of clinical data that allows us to unravel the disease processes and the genetic architectures. So this is a project that we've been doing as part of a partnership with Gilead, where the goal is to understand this disease called NASH, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. This is a type of a fatty liver disease where often, but not always due to metabolic um, insults like a bad diet, uh, there is an accumulation of lipid droplets in the hepatocytes. Um, this is called steatosis. Um, that, in turn, causes an inflammation of, um, of the liver, uh, which causes a change in cell morphology called ballooning. It gives rise to um, a process called fibrosis, which is effectively a formation of the scar in the liver. And ultimately, when the fibrosis becomes very advanced, it's a state called cirrhosis, which often leads to things like liver cancer and is likely um, to, and likely to lead to a liver, to the need for a liver transplant. NASH is a relatively newly um, uncovered disease um, driven by the dietary changes that we're seeing, but it's poised to become one of the largest causes of liver transplant and liver cancer um, in, um, in the world over the coming decade. So here we were working with um, histopathology images from liver biopsies of different patients, um, and these are 
Um, these are taken using a needle biopsy, they're put on a slide, and then they're stained using standard h &E. And then a pathologist looks at the entire slide and scores it on the four things that we talked about on the previous slide. Steatosis, inflammation, ballooning, or the change in morphology in the hepatocytes, and fibrosis. So that's four scores for a ton of data that you can see on a slide. Um, and almost certainly there is more information there to be had. So the goal is to extract more information from the histopathology data to provide both a better diagnostic tool, but also more importantly for us, insight on disease processes and pathophysiology that allow us to then uh, understand the genetic associations that drive the, the disease at a much finer level than you can by just looking, for instance, for associations with these four numbers. So here we took, um, now the problem is that we don't really know um, which of the, um, the, sorry, the problem here is that the sample is very heterogeneous. A person's liver has a ton of heterogeneity in it. Some regions exhibit steatosis, others have already advanced towards fibrosis. So the four numbers that the pathologist assigns might come from any part of this very large image. So um, in order to address that problem, what we ended up doing is dividing the overall sample, the overall image, into small tiles. Um, each of those, uh, we extracted features. And then we designed an attention mechanism that automatically selects the most relevant tiles for each score. So effectively, the neural network here not only does not know what steatosis looks like, it also doesn't know where in a given image steatosis or fibrosis may have been found. And so it's effectively trying to learn both the, um, both the characterization of each of these pathologies, but also where in a given image they may have been found. And so that was um, an extension of ResNet. And um, this, the nice thing is that it worked really well and was able to automatically disentangle the different axes of the disease. So if you see here, this is a TSNI embedding of the different tile representations. And you can see that it separated out the tiles that uh, had steatosis, tiles that had inflammation, the tiles that had fibrosis, and really picked up on a correct biological representation of what these different um, uh, components look like in, in the image. Now, if you want to quantitatively uh, validate this, you can uh, do use cross-validation relative to the pathologist scores. And here we were very careful about not falling into the trap that was outlined in the Badgley paper. So the cross-validation was performed on a disjoint set of clinical centers than the ones that were used for training. And what you see here is um, the correlation between the pathologist score and the predicted uh, ML score for those different uh, factors, fibrosis, steatosis, ballooning, and inflammation. And you see that there's a very strong correlation uh, between those different um, between those different factors. Now, notably, um, for instance, for the fibrosis score, the correlation is 0 0.9, um, it's 0 0.7 for some of the others. The cross pathologist agreement is generally 0 0.7, so we're actually at or beyond state of the art. What's also notable is that for fibrosis, this is um, not something that pathologist typically calls using just a standard H and E stain. There's also an additional stain called trichrome that makes the uh, fibrosis really stand out. Turns out that uh, machine learning doesn't need that extra stain. The pathologist, the, the calls on fibrosis are as accurate as they are using only the H and E images, even though the pathologist would not be able to make similar calls using H and E alone. Now, for us, the purpose of doing this, as I said, was really to uncover biology that allows us to really dig into the causal mechanisms of, of the disease and identify critical factors that are disease drivers that might serve as the beginning for new drug targets. So, um, so what we see here is the correlation between these new um, 
these these new phenotypes, these quantitative phenotypes that the machine learning has uncovered, and other things that we know are relevant to disease state. On the left is 60 blood biomarkers that we know are um, relevant to NASH pathophysiology, um, things like insulin or the ELF score, which is actually the best blood biomarker currently known for NASH. And we see that the continuous scores are consistently on pretty much every single factor better correlated with those blood biomarkers than the pathology scores. We also have um, RNA-seq from the livers of those patients. And here also we see a much, much better correlation of the continuous scores from the machine learning than from the, patho than the pathologist scores. And finally, um, when it comes down to the really important thing from the perspective of drug discovery, which is identifying genes whose expression and baseline appears to be causal for disease progression, then we see that the um, RNA, that the ISHAC score, the, the pathologist called fibrosis scores, is able to identify one such gene, whereas um, our analysis is able to identify 130. And those were really fundamental in helping us identify new and important targets for, that are implicated as part of the genetic architecture of MASH. So that was the first vignette, and now let's move on to the second, which is how do we then use our understanding of the genetic architecture to uh, design better cellular models that are predictive of human clinical outcome. And that those cellular models are critical for us in identifying and validating drug targets. So the goal of this part of our work is to answer the fundamental question of what will an intervention do when we administer it to a person. Now, the standard model for this is um, is a mouse. That's the work. That's the workhorse, or I guess the work mouse of drug discovery is to uh, make an intervention in a mouse, see what it does there, and then extrapolate from that to a human. The problem is that mice are not people. They have very different biology, very different genetics, and many times um, interventions that are very effective in mice do nothing for a human. Um, and partly that's because many of the diseases that are currently of unmet need in the human are simply not things that mice ever get. And so we create a simulacrum of these diseases in the mouse and hope that somehow by curing the simulacrum, uh, it is helpful in similarly addressing the disease in the human. And in most cases, that just unfortunately does not happen. So the question is, can we somehow use humans as a model system for humans? So how do we do that? Um, so first of all, this is a place where we now have access to very large amounts of data about human biology that we can bring to bear. Um, here is a revolution that's occurred over the last 20 years in the amount of human genetic data that is available to us in understanding the causal factors of drive human disease. Um, this is a graph, it's actually a Moore's law graph because it's on a logarithmic scale that shows the number of human genomes that have been sequenced since the very first human genome in um, 2000, around 2000 up until today. And what you can see is that not only is this graph growing exponentially, it's growing exponentially twice as fast as Moore's law. So depending on whether you of what you believe the future trend line to be, um, the number of human genomes that we will have sequenced by, say, 2025 or, um, or 2030 will be around 100 million to 2 billion, which is an awful lot of genomes. Now, genomes on their own are actually surprisingly useful, but they're even more useful when you combine them with human phenotypes that, or, that allow us to understand the connection between the genetics and uh, what um, and the human characteristics. So there's a not quite as much human phenotypic data as there is genotypes, but, um, but there is still a growing amount and some of it is very high quality. So my favorite in this regard is the UK Biobank data, which has 500,000 people um, of 
all different ages with different uh, medical conditions. And for each of those, there's been a collection of a large number of phenotypic outcomes that include uh, physiology, uh, cognition, uh, history, predisposing factors, whole body and brain imaging, and many, many other aspects that um, that are measurable and that um, we, where we can also align them with the genetics of those individuals. So if you have genetics and you have outcomes, um, then one thing that you can immediately do is to look at genetic associations, associations between genetic variants and phenotypes. And because the genetics preceded the phenotypes, then this is one place where with some uh, caveats, but small ones, you can actually infer causality of the genetics of the outcomes. So that's great. Um, and indeed, that's driven a large amount of research on understanding which genetic factors um, seem to be um, causal for different diseases. So this is something that's called genome-wide association. And um, starting with the earliest ones in the late, uh, in 2005 to 2008, um, we had uh, for many diseases as well as um, other things that are not diseases, um, analyses that tell us what genetic factors are associated with each of those diseases. And there's now tens of thousands of these, very, of these associations that have been uncovered. And indeed, the, the causal relationship between human genetics and, um, and disease really does help with drug discovery. So this is a study that has been uh, now replicated several times by different researchers that suggests that when you have support from human genetics for a given drug target, that considerably increases the approval odds. So maybe focusing on the chart on the right, this is the log, this is the odds ratio of approval of a drug that from the preclinical stage all the way to approval if it does versus doesn't have genetic support. And we can see that it's about a 2x increase in approval. So that's very exciting um, because that could double the productivity of, of this very um, challenging problem. Um, but it turns out that, unfortunately, the situation is a little bit more complex than that because um, it turns out that it's different for the nature of the genetic evidence that you have. So um, if what you have is a strong Mendelian association between a variant and um, and the disease, where it's really a strong relationship between one gene and one disease, then in fact the odds ratio is actually even better than two. It's almost um, higher than 2.5. Conversely, if what you have is data from a genome-wide association study where oftentimes there are dozens or even hundreds of variants associated with uh, the disease, then the challenge of selecting among them for a target that is truly disease-modifying um, is not that easy, and the odds ratio gets to less than 1.5, which is still good, but it's not nearly as good as the, um, odds, as the odds ratio of 2, which we had before. So the question is, can we use human genetics in a different way in order to identify um, causal factors of disease? So what we hope to do here is to bring back some of these ideas that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, which is, to, ident to use the, our ability to generate biological data at scale to really tease apart that connection between the genetics and the human clinical outcome and put an intermediate point that is closer to the genetics and hence uh, the relationship is more direct and yet speaks to human clinical outcome. So in order to do that, we've put together the following uh, approach that really helps us use genetics, but in a different way than what people typically have. So what we do is we begin with um, using ex human data in order to um, derive insights 
um, from about the genetics that give us a better understanding of the genetic architecture of disease. So this is a combination of machine learning together with statistical genetics, and it gives us a genetic architecture um, that can often involve dozens, if not hundreds, of genes that are implicated. Then the next step, though, is rather than just look at the list and try and guess which of those genes is actually relevant, the next step is to use that in order to build model systems of disease that allow us uh, to study what the effect of each of those genes is in a in vitro model that is hopefully predictive of, um, of what will happen in a human. So what we do here is we take these iPS cells from different patients that correspond to a different level of disease burden. Um, we potentially expand those further using technologies like CRISPR in order to have an even broader set of diversity in terms of the genetic architecture. And that creates, you can think of as a clinical trial in a dish. It's a genetically diverse set of genotypes um, in iPS cells that are then differentiated into the right lineage, um, for instance, say hepatocytes in the context of NASH or neurons if we're doing CMS disease, and then we can look to see how the um, iPS, how the cells that had the, that originated from, say, patients where there is a genetic burden of disease um, might differ in their appearance from the cells that originated from healthy human individuals. And so that that model system is then fed into um, a machine learning model uh, where we take many, many measurements of each of those cells and use the machine learning to help us identify how different clinical outcomes might appear at the cellular level. And that, in turn, um, allows us to tie back the um, the cellular phenotypes that we see in a dish to the clinical outcomes which we actually care about, which allows us to generate novel insights on um, patient subpopulations that might appear um, that might appear the same at the clinical level, but be quite distinct at the cellular level. Um, we can try different interventions in the system in order to see whether um, those might drive the disease. Um, from an unhealthy to a healthy state at the cellular level and hopefully achieve um, also uh, beneficial goals then at the clinical level. So the fundamental core of this, uh, of this approach is what we call the, phenotypic, the cellular phenotypic manifold. So this is um, taking the, in this, the data that we have on the different cells with a different genetic background and using um, machine learning models, specifically deep learning, to embed those data points in a, in a low dimensional manifold that sits in the very high dimensional space. Now, one of the things that we believe will emerge from that is, um, is a segmentation of those cells into subsets that look quite different from each other at the cellular level. So um, each of those uh, would might correspond to some cluster that, although clinically presents the same, is actually um, uh, is actually um, corresponds to a different uh, subtype of disease and might benefit from a different intervention. This, in fact, has been what's driven precision oncology, where we used to think, say, breast cancer is one disease, but now we understand that breast cancer is actually multiple diseases, and we treat each of those using a very different intervention. So we treat someone with a BRCA1 mutation very differently than someone who's, say, HER2 positive. So let's see how this works. So I'm going to show you some results. Uh, the first of those is um, the classification of uh, genetic interventions. This is a toy machine learning example. It's not the problem that we actually care to solve, but just to illustrate that we are able, by looking at cells under the microscope, 
to distinguish different genetics. So what we did here is we took a bunch of, in this case, identical cells. Uh, we subjected each of them to a different genetic intervention using a technology called CRISPR inhibition, which reduces the expression of a single gene by about 20 to 40%. So this is a pretty subtle intervention because it only touches one gene and only reduces expression by a relatively modest amount. And so looking, um, and so it's hard to look at those cells and, and um, really tell the difference. But um, turns out that machine learning was actually quite nicely able to do that. And there is, um, the, and we were able to take those 12, um, 12 interventions and uh, identify what the genetic perturbation was with an accuracy of 70%. By comparison, a state-of-the-art approach using engineered features that were engineered by um, a human expert in cell biology was only able to achieve an accuracy of 57%. So now moving on to something that is more um, uh, relevant to the kinds of problems that we're looking at, we wanted to do the same for NASH. So here we actually ended up using not um, iPS cells, but rather NASH primary hepatocytes that um, were taken from NASH patients and healthy individuals um, using a liver biopsy. And we began by showing this to a um, human expert and asking them to look at the cells under the microscope and figure out which are the NASH cells and which are the um, from healthy individuals, and even trained cell biologists were not able to see the difference. However, the machine learning model was actually quite nicely able to separate the NASH from the non-NASH tiles and um, with, a pretty, with a pretty high accuracy. So that is nice, but of course we don't really care about the prediction problem here. We're using it as a surrogate to uncover underlying biology and a better understanding of the disease. So in order to gain that understanding, what we did is we looked at um, the most extremely ranked tiles for NASH versus the most extremely ranked tiles for non-NASH to really see what it was picking up on that allowed it to make uh, that distinction, and what we see is that uh, you don't. What you don't see is a difference. For instance, oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to say the pink here is nucleus, the blue is cell membrane, and the green are lipid droplets. And what you see is a clear phenotypic difference of accumulation of large lipid droplets at the nuclear membrane, and that seems to be a phenotype that is quite relevant um, to the disease. So the last case study that I'd like to show you is something that we've done not in NASH but in um, a CN but in CNS diseases that have to do with schizophrenia and autism that are often um, two sides of the same coin and share a lot of um, genetics. Um, and so this actually brings those two pieces together because what we did is we took a single cell background and we created different mutations in that single cell background using CRISPR that corresponds to different um, uh, high penetrance variants that have been identified in recent um, uh, whole genome sequencing of autism and schizophrenia patients. So uh, what we see here are um, different different interventions with, um, in this case, four different genes. And it's actually quite interesting uh, to see uh, what we observe here. So first of all, TSC2 is a very um, well understood uh, mutation. It's been um, observed in previous work and it creates a very strong high visibility phenotype in, um, in those mutated cells and you can see that they look quite different. And sure enough, the machine learning was able to see that the, uh, these iPSC-derived neurons are quite different in the TSC2 mutants than they are in the wild-type controls. Um, on the right-hand side, you see two overlapping clusters. One is called TCF4, and the other is called Clybol. Uh, Clybol is a negative control. It's a mutation that's known not to act on neurons. TCF4, which leads to Pitt-Hopkins disease, was not 
fully understood. It was presumed that it might act on a cell type other than neurons, but it wasn't known for a fact. And here we see a perfect overlap between TCF4 and Clibol, suggesting that indeed the effect of TCF4 is in a cell type other than neurons. The last one down at the bottom is a new gene that's recently been uncovered in whole genome sequencing studies. And what we see here are two distinct guide RNAs um, that make slightly different mutations in that gene. And we see that they cluster together and quite differently from the negative controls, suggesting that here is a high penetrance mutation that is indeed different from, uh, that, that indeed acts on neurons and might provide an interesting therapeutic um, subtype of a disease that might benefit from an intervention. So here I'm going to focus now on the first end-to-end -end, um, disease model that we've done. And this is in the TSC2 mutation, which is um, largely replicating, but with a twist, uh, work that's been done on TSC2. So TSC2 is a gene that's implicated in a disease that's called tuberosclerosis complex. It's a rare disease, but it's not ultra rare. It exists in one in 6,000 live births. And, um, and when you have that mutation, the patients exhibit growth throughout the body, including the skin, the lungs, the kidneys, the heart, and the brain. And when there's uh, growth in the brain, it's called hamartomas, which causes severe and often intractable epilepsy. That's quite frequent. And there's also some fairly significant chances of intellectual disability and autism. Now, it turns out that um, TSC2 acts in, uh, in the mTOR pathway, and there is the possibility, using a chemical intervention of a compound called rapamycin, to act on this gene called mTOR and basically reverse the phenotype of this disease. So how do we, would we have been able to uncover that using the technology the platform that we've, that we've been building up? So here's, um, here's an attempt to do this. So we took iPSC derived, um, we took iPSC cells, we derived uh, neurons from them uh, using the TSC2 double knockout. And when you use very specialized assays that measure specific proteins that are known to be involved in the mTOR pathway, you can see um, very clear phenotypes in the uh, in the TSC2 mutants relative to the wild type. These are the left hand. Uh, this, these are panels two and four, which look quite different from uh, the panel on the left, which is the wild type. And what's important is that when you subject them to a chemical treatment um, that is, uh, that we showed on the previous slide, they begin to uh, appear much more like the wild type. And so what we see here is a clear example of a chemical reversion of a disease from a disease phenotype back to a normal phenotype. So can we do that using our approach without knowing a priori what to look for? So it turns out that when we use an untargeted assay, specifically the cell paint assays that just stains major cellular compartments, it makes the phenotypes much harder to discern than the specialized um, assays that I showed on the previous slide. What made things even harder is that because of the COVID-19 lab shutdown, we had to cut short the experiment. So rather than letting the neurons mature for 40 days to the uh, point where the phenotypes would become highly visible, we hoped, uh, we had to shut down the experiment after day 15 when they were very much immature and before the disease had had a chance to manifest. So when the team looked at those two slides, they basically said, look, these two look just the same. There is no way that we'll ever be able to see a disease phenotype, far less detect reversion. Well, it turns out that machine learning is actually uh, much better than people at detecting these phenotypes, even from these untargeted assays, and gets almost perfect prediction between healthy and sick. So that was the first part of the good news. The second question is, well, can we actually identify reversion?
And this is a potentially challenging problem because how do you know, um, I mean, if there's not a perfect reversion fully to healthy, can you really tell that something is heading in the right direction? So we tried to, um, we tested this hypothesis by looking at a number of different treatments, uh, two that were, uh, we had two controls that had no effect whatsoever. We had two that were uh, brain penetrant and had an effect on phenotype, but not um, treatments for the disease, and two that were known uh, actors on the mTOR pathway that we knew reverted the disease. So these are the two that are orthogonal compounds, um, rotenone and loxetine. And you can see that by and large, uh, here the knockout is, um, which is the disease are the pink, the wild type are the greens, the knockout plus the drug are the blue, and the wild type plus the drug are the orange. And basically there is no movement of the um, disease towards the healthy. Whereas when we look at the two compounds that are known to be treatments for the disease, there is a significant shift to um, towards the um, towards the towards the healthy state. So we can compare again from here to here. We can see that there is more cells that were um, knockouts that were moving towards the healthy state. So this is an illustration that you could actually identify these. Um, uh, intervening compounds using the kinds of generic assays that we put in place here. So, um, taking a big step back um, and reminding ourselves of what we're doing here, um, this uh, what we're building here is a company that really tries to bring together two worlds into a single integrated whole. We're building on the one side a biological data factory that manufactures data at unprecedented scales by combining a range of tools that are uh, that have each been developed quite recently, but together are able to create massive amounts of disease relevant data, which can then feed into machine learning models that allow those data to be interpreted. Um, and the effects of interventions that may impact human health to be identified. Taking even a larger step back, um, I'd like to I like to think of this current era as being a particularly important moment in time for this field. When one takes a historical view of science, there are um, in each uh, there are periods of, of history where one discipline has um, really taken off and made a tremendous amount of progress in a short amount of time because of some new insight or new way of measuring things. So back in the um, 1800s, that discipline was chemistry because of the understanding of the periodic table. Um, in the 1900s, that discipline was physics, where we understood the connection between energy and matter and between space and time. In the 1950s, that discipline was computing, where because of the understanding of how one could use silicone chips to perform computations, we were suddenly able to solve using computer problems that up until that point only a person, and sometimes not even a person, had been able to solve. And then in the 1990s, there was this interesting bifurcation because two disciplines suddenly started to make tremendous amounts of progress at the same time. On the one side was the era of data, which emerged from computing, but also involved other disciplines like statistics and neuroscience and optimization. On the other side was the era of what you might call quantitative biology, which leveraged many of the advances that have come up from physics and chemistry, as well as from computing, to measure biology at an unprecedented scale using things like microscopy and sequencing. Um, and these two transformations took place in parallel and with very little interaction between them. I think the next epoch that's coming up is the synthesis of those two disciplines. It's a, it, it's a discipline that I'm calling digital biology, and it involves the ability to measure biology at an unprecedented scale, to interpret what we're measuring 
using the analytical techniques of data science and machine learning and to feed those insights back into biology um, to make interventions that cause biological systems to behave in ways other than they would otherwise do uh, and that are more beneficial. And there's going to be, in my opinion, repercussions of this type of approach, not only in human health, which is what I've discussed today, but also in areas like um, environmental science in creating, for instance, um, uh, different ways of intervening in the environment to address some of the impact of climate change, in biofuels, in materials design, in agriculture, and many others uh, are going to benefit from this synthesis of the digital world and the biological world. I think it's a tremendously exciting time to be in this space and also a tremendously exciting opportunity for those of us like myself who grew up as machine learning people to work in an area where one can really make a difference to making the world a better place. Thank you very much.